Hi, I'm Vivian Long, and I'm a music theorist currently living in Saskatoon, Canada, which is situated in Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Hi, I'm Danielle Sofer, and I'm a music theorist and musicologist. I'm working in tech currently in Dublin, Ireland. And welcome to our first install installation of our conversations from Engaged Music Theory, the working group for Engaged Music Theory. Uh, and uh, so the Engaged Music Theory Working Group was formed in 2019 to deepen members' approaches to cultivating inclusive research, teaching, and service within music theory. The group is comprised of junior scholars across Canada, Ireland, and the United States. And inspired by Naomi Andre's vision of an engaged musicology from her 2018 book, Black Opera, History, Power, Engagement, we call for a music theoretical practice that explores, quote, the ways race, gender, sexuality, and nation, and other forms of identity shape the tools that we bring with us to a work. In our most recent initiative, we compiled a searchable bibliography that foregrounds the long tradition of engaged music theoretical scholarship that has continually pushed the boundaries of the field. EMT is now launching a series of blog posts that feature insights by music theorists whose work foregrounds issues of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, place, class, <laughs> intersectionality, decolonization, and disability. We are delighted to kick off this blog series with a video conversation between Professor Naomi Andre and Professor Sumanth Gopinath. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so um, we're really excited about the conversation, but actually before launching into our conversation, we thought it'd be helpful to introduce or reintroduce our viewers to your background and your work by reading your bios. So I'll start with Naomi's. Um, so Naomi Andre is professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, Women's and Gender Studies, and the Residential College at the University of Michigan. She received her BA from Barnard College and MA and PhD in Musicology from Harvard University. Her research focuses on opera and issues surrounding gender, voice, and race in the US, Europe, and South Africa. Her publications include topics on Italian opera, Schoenberg, women composers, and teaching opera in prisons. Her book, Black Opera, History, Power, Engagement, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2018, won the Lowen's Book Award from the Society for American Music and the Judy Sow Critical Race Studies Award from the American Musicological Society. Her earlier books include Voicing Gender, Castrati, Travesti, and The Second Woman in Early 19th Century Italian Opera, published in 2006, and Blackness in Opera, which was a co-edited collection published in 2012. She has edited and contributed to clusters of articles in African Studies and the Journal of the Society for American Music. Currently, she is a co-editor for the essay collection African Performance Arts and Political Acts, forthcoming in 2021 with the University of Michigan Press. She is the inaugural scholar in residence at the Seattle Opera and a founding member of the Black Opera Research Group, oh, sorry, Black Opera Research Network, or BORN. And Sumanth Gopinath is Associate Professor of Music Theory in the School of Music at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. His research interests include Steve Reich, musical minimalism, sound studies, new media, Marxism, and US American and British concert, experimental and popular music of the 20th and 21st centuries. He's the author of The Ringtone Dialectic from MIT Press in 2013 and co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Mobile Music Studies in 2014 with Jason Staniak and Rethinking Reich from Oxford University Press in 2019 with Pauch Aufshan. Oh, sorry, Pauch Aufshan. He is the leader of the independent Americana band, The Gated Community. So welcome again. Um, so I'm going to start off with our first uh, first topic of discussion here. Um, so many of our viewers may have joined uh, us today because they're familiar with or are interested in the work that EMT does as a group, but we thought it'd be beneficial to hear what engaged music studies means to you, our invited conversation partners. So could each of you say a few words about being engaged and how this vision shapes your own work? I want to defer to Naomi, so. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, sure. I actually have thought a lot about this and um, I initially thought of engaged musicology or engaged music studies as an analytic tool for asking certain questions that traditional um, tools in musicology and its sister uh, music scholarship disciplines didn't jump in or didn't feel to me as being um, getting to the full question. Now, I'm a, a huge fan of the methodological tools that we have, but um, what I, the types of questions to add on to that was when I was looking at something, and particularly this came out of me as an opera scholar, I was interested in sort of uh, who is the compositional team. So if the three rubrics just really uh, quickly, who's the compositional team in terms of opera, that would be the composer and the librettist. And if there was a particular director or somebody they were working with to for the first performance. The second um, rubric is who are those embodying the music on stage, whether it's a concert stage, a dramatic stage, um, who is there, who um, are we using blackface or yellow face or who is actually making the music in the um, orchestra pit or up on stage like who who are the people there and especially with performance unlike poetry or um, visual arts it's reenacted and so it's filtered through our bodies music is the third rubric is sort of taking into account who are we in the audience when we're not on stage? Who are we in terms of the scholarship and theoretical discussions as we're writing about and documenting this um, event? And behind these three rubrics, sort of who's the compositional team, who's embodying the music on stage, and then who is in the audience and writing about things, our identities and the history of these identities with oppression really has shaped who we are, how we're seen on stage, what, we're, what we've been exposed to our major influences. And you can't just assume that um, a Latinx um, performer has not had classical ballet background. So I'm not trying to essentialize any of these things, but just how these multiple identities, seen and unseen, are um, shaping how we approach art. Wow, that's great. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I was thinking about this earlier and because of the coming from this from music theory, I think that there are specific kinds of issues and dynamics that are characteristic of of the field of music theory that may not be as um, I mean, there's still plenty of things that musicologists and ethnomusicologists are kind of working through and, you know, the the current moment, you know, shaped by George Floyd's murder and the uprising that followed and the, you know, but I think music theory has a special kind of problem, which is the problem, which is what is the music itself? What is music theoretical? And so um, that has led, I think, to certain kinds of policing within the field that I think maybe don't at least I'm not aware of them in the same way in ethnomusicology and in musicology, in part because, at least from my personal experience, my work has been welcomed in those venues, but um, I've encountered, you know, various problems of various sorts being told, you know, my work isn't music theoretical or I'm not a music theorist or what have you. And so, um, yeah, and I think so when I think of engaged music theory, I, which is, you know, coming from the the engaged music studies that uh, that, you know, your group is kind of working on feels like music theory is of the three you know sort of components of music studies at least in the north american context is is the most trying to be disengaged whatever that might mean and so i guess for me um you know the two levels at which i'm interested in are trying to kind of think across you know the different um, sort of modalities or disciplinary, you know, uh, literatures that I'm engaging in for a particular problem. A lot of this is shaped by, you know, my Marxist uh, scholarly background and interests. And so connecting things up in the totality, which is, you know, a kind of standard Marxist way of thinking about things um, is really, you know, important to me. And in some ways is just resonant with, you know, historicism and ethnocritical kinds of approaches too. I mean, you know, they're not fundamental. Well, they're different in certain ways, but um, but they're very related. 
And I think music theory tries to define itself by refusing those things in favor of the music itself, a certain kind of technicity, you know, a certain kind of systematicity as to how um, we are supposed to understand music. Um, so that's the, the, the one piece is for me that, and then the other pieces I also feel really strongly about and have been in, engaged in for a long time in academic activism, especially like union labor organizing, unionization campaigns and other sorts of forms of academic organizing. And so for me, um, one of the things that I would like music scholarship to be doing is to be engaging with the very conditions of our own work, which include, you know, a, a massive transformation in the way music uh, and, you know, music scholarly education are being conducted in higher education institutions because increasingly vast numbers and the vast majority of higher education is being delivered by non tenure stream faculty. Yeah. And so trying to organize those faculty, trying to advocate for them, uh, trying to recognize our, you know, my own privilege as being a tenured faculty member. These are the kinds of things that I think um, music scholarship just at, and music institutions, uh, you know, music scholarly institutions absolutely have to engage with and other academic institutions are doing that work. And I think we're, we're not doing enough of it. So uh, those are two perspectives for me, but there are lots of things to say about this. Yeah, I'm so glad, sorry, I was just going to jump in really quickly, forgive me for saying, I'm so glad that you've, you're, you brought up these issues and how it really matters. Everyone, uh, you know, it, it, people who get older <laughs> or, and who have the, the luxury of getting older, I've been a musicologist now, you know, since I graduated grad school in the late 90s. And you think of sort of a succession plan, sort of what is this discipline going to look like? You try to make, you do the best you can for your moment, but then looking in the future. And one of the very dire things is what is up with this contingent faculty that will not have the luxury to sit and think and express dare things without that sort of cushion of knowing I have health insurance and I have periodical sab sabbaticals where I can do a deep dive you know hopefully I know that's not for everyone but um, every situation but where you can do a deep dive into research and thinking about things the academy has been built on this and it, it's changing and it's not it's not fair and we need to figure out how so i'm so glad and and i love this is coming up with an engaged musicology because i coined this term sort of um or engaged music studies in one context but i just love the idea that it's growing or people are finding it useful for other situations yeah, that's great and i yeah. should say just to be fair on the field that i'm in i mean there are plenty of music theorists including those of you in the group and um, and many beyond who are who don't uh, you know ascribe subscribe to the kind of autonomous music theory kind of position and so I think in in a variety of ways the field is incredibly diverse now and so I I celebrate and want to support that um, so I should should just state that in case I'm sort of turning music theory into a straw man or something. I guess that was my follow up question um, exactly and and and. And Naomi also bridged some areas here that I wanted to explore a little bit more. So um, I think that we, we're all familiar with this, um, the notion of the disengaged or disembodied, disinterested music theorists. Musicologists can be just as uh, disinterested in, in certain ways, um, focusing on objects over uh, how the objects relate to one another. Um, and I think that Naomi, you spent a lot of time exploring the theory that you propose for engagement. And I was wondering if you could maybe step back a little and give us some um, background to how this, if you could state more explicitly how this differs from what came before. Because um, I think, I mean, those of us that have read your work, it's, it's, it's clear to us, and especially those of us that are here who are engaged um <laughs> i hope i'm engaged um and i think that that's one of the things that i just want to say explicitly is that it's kind of dangerous to maybe rely too hard on 
on saying people are disengaged and, and we could shift our, our gaze towards people who are engaged and make, make them our audience. Mm. Yeah, that, you've outlined a lot of topics here. Um, one of the things I'll talk about sort of how I got to this um, position or some of the sort of shaping and some of the maybe challenges I've faced in figuring out sort of what does it mean to be engaged. We're, we're very much about survival. For a big chunk of my academic career um, has been outside of a musicology department. So, and outside of a school of music. So I needed to make my work legible to um, people who didn't, we didn't share sort of the, the same training. So really trying to talk um, across fault lines. And I like this idea of sort of fault lines um, that are potentially sort of where different plates come together that are particularly um, vulnerable, but also can be explosive. Um, yeah, I'm not going to take the earthquake metaphor too far, but just sort of different moments where things come together. So I've been in interdisciplinary um, disciplines, such as women's and gender studies, um, as well as African and African American studies. And there's a difference between being housed in a music department and bringing these things into your work, which is what I had been when I was first here at the University of Michigan, but then having to sort of understand different histories and the things I have with musicology and understanding how ethnomusicology, comparative musicology, music theory, um, how sound studies, systematic musicology, there's just sort of the history of the discipline. So having one set of training, but then wanting to to bring in some of these other issues around sort of how do we talk about bodies and gender and sex and expression of these elements. So sort of learning, for example, one example is um, in women's and gender studies, one of the big fault lines is around queer studies and then around sort of race, ethnicity and nation. And it's not like um, they're all meant to happen together. It's part of you know, what makes something interdisciplinary. But in practicality, sort of how the social sciences, the humanities, how um, these different, um, what, what's emphasized, what's not emphasized, that's, that's sort of, it's interesting to sort of be on the inside and watch junior scholars come up and graduate students and sort of help train them. In African and African American studies, you've got the African continent, you've got the United States, the African American, but then you've got this whole diaspora, which includes the Caribbean, as well as Black Germans, or the Windrush generations in the UK, or Afro-Brazilian identities. So really understanding sort of what are the neat categories and where things are less neat. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but just sort of what is engaged musicology? Well, it's having this deep dive and not assuming you know everything. That's a tough thing for music programs because when you have a defined canon of Western European music, it is possible to get a really, and you can read what people have written and you understand the field. And engaged musicology makes us all a little bit more vulnerable because we're jumping into fields outside of what maybe our home discipline teaches, but we're trying to, or I'm trying to make things a little more, um, intelligible and legible to folks outside of my own discipline, you know, the discipline I went to graduate school in. Yeah, it's so interesting. It makes me think in some ways of the ways in which um, Susan McClary's work uh, emerged out of the fact that she faced these disciplinary challenges that external reviewers, my sense is it was Harold Powers, among others, who basically prevented her from publishing her work in early modern music studies. And so that was one of the impetuses or motivations for reaching out and thinking much more interdisciplinarily and communicating to audiences that weren't necessarily, you know, audiences who are music experts. And so, you know, even though she's a you know, fabulous musician and knows tons about music, obviously, but she's you know, it was through that work that Feminine Ending has kind of emerged and ended up, you know, one of those, you know, books that just changed everyone in our field. And so, so yeah, so I, I, in some ways you're, anyway, I'm just noticing a parallel there, which is, um, which is, uh, I, I don't know, interesting. And I think your work has like, likewise shaped so many people's thinking in the, in, especially in the current moment. So, um, 
And the second thing I was going to say is that um, interdisciplinarity is something that is really common in many ways in academic work, but how it's done, I think, varies a lot. And so, for example, um, I, I remember a while ago reading a book by Andrew Barry and Georgina Bourne, where they're talking about different models of this. And one common one is a kind of extractive one where you go to another discipline, you kind of take stuff and then you bring it back to yours and you assimilate it into mm -hmm. your field. And uh, music theorists, I mean, we do this a lot. We kind of find, you know, some interesting idea or somewhere else that we can kind of turn into machinery for what we do. Um, different kinds of labels, different kinds of, you know, maybe analytic perspectives, but we help it build up our systems and systematicity in the way that, you know, we have done in different ways. In, in many ways, the way we do this with philosophy, it would be a, an example that we're, you know, it isn't always by any means like this, but it has the capacity to be like that. Um, and I guess I would say that um, I, I I really agree with what you were saying, Naomi, and I like the the risk and the kind of encounter where you you don't often know what the questions are or what the right thing is when you're engaging in a particular subject uh, because it's a new one and i think um i've always been most attracted to project specific kinds of studies where the the subject matter you know the meeting point of the subject matter and my own perspectives and you know expertise and lack of it um lead to kind of trying to formulate questions that seem, you know, specific to that issue, whether it's the ringtone industry, something I didn't know much about until I started kind of diving into it. I've been working on a project on prints recently, so that's a whole totally different thing or or whatever, right? And so it it seems like you have to kind of, at least for me, there's this organic kind of dialectical process of really engaging what the subject seems to want to tell me or what I'm interested in vis-a-vis -vis it and learning from as I learn about it. Um, and then trying to generate research questions rather than trying to just like sort of reproduce my discipline, which is, you know, what, you know, certainly often happens in music theory, I think. I love that you put yourself so much at the center of, uh, because we are, as we're writing, we're, it's, you know, coming through us and our thoughts, but to realize that you are not trying to replicate, okay, I'm going to be a monk in the, you know, 11th century and I'm just writing you know in my own zone only for me not that that's exactly what they were doing but to realize that when you look at you know 11th century um, manuscripts or writings treatises from there that you are very much doing it through your your world of where you are in Minneapolis with an interest in prints and all the things that you know print signals and brings up that you can still look at the past but it's going to be shaped by who we are today it's a little naive to think that we can you know re <laughs> replicate something in the past. We're living people where we have different associations and we interact with things and hopefully we're communicating to other people today. So we want them to be able to understand, like, why should I care about opera? Well, interestingly, there's some great treasures from the past and let me help you understand, you know, how maybe class was working and gender in Mozart's Figaro. But also we've got all these new operas that are writing about, you know, Margaret Garner and, um, um, uh, Janine Tesori and Taswell Thompson's Blue, and you know, like they're that they're engaging different issues. Anthony Davis's X, uh, Life and Times of Malcolm X. What is who is Malcolm X in 1986, a few decades after he was assassinated? I mean, we need to know who he was in his own time, but what is that world from 1986? And what does it mean to look at it right now after last summer and this summer as we're, you know, all the energies internationally around the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as the Me Too movement, as well as the pandemic? You know, it's like it becomes very exciting to think that there's a relevance there's a connection I don't think it's diluting the the question it's um it's just we can't ever do everything so it's approaching it from an angle that feels right for now yeah that's a, I, I completely agree and think that that's so right because it's you know you're writing you're as a writer you're writing for audiences who are alive now right they're <laughs> reading now and this is what historians are often doing that they go back and they they may encounter 
new archival evidence based on new questions that are relevant again to what scholars are thinking now or they might you know retell a story that may have been told but reframing it in a different way because of who we are now like you can't take the you out of the scholarship that's definitely i know i i completely agree with that so um yeah it's in a way i think maybe because i've been another influence of mine has been uh, Jim Hapakoski's work and the way that he would teach, you know, the kind of Gadamerian sort of perspectives on tradition and the fact that, you know, you are kind of interacting with the past that like you, it, it never takes the you out of it, you know, that there's, nice. that, that seems like central to the, the process, which is ultimately a kind of hermeneutic one. And so, yeah, anyway, um, I'm just rambling now, but I uh, agree with what you're saying, Amy. No, oh, well, I love it. Thanks. <laughs> I agree too. I like this I, construction of the you in the scholarship now. Yeah. I was just was tracing the conversation and was noticing, you know, all of the wonderful interdisciplinary spaces in which your work is in dialogue with. But I was wondering if we could switch the focus towards music studies to talk about maybe some of the advantages that you see in situating your work and being in conversation, particularly with music studies. I can jump in really quickly here and forgive me, Sumanth, you are so generous to always let me just sort of barge in here. <laughs> Please feel free to, to jump in. So um, in terms of music studies, I was trained as a traditional musicologist and I did my graduate work at Harvard and worked with some wonderful people. Um, and then my first job was in musicology, but I was sort of um, ejected out of that environment. And I um, have spent the last 18 years working in a liberal arts college, uh, the liberal arts college of the University of Michigan, literature, sciences, and the arts. And I've been in women and gender studies, as well as um, African, Afro-American, African studies is what they call it. And I have an appointment in the residential college, which is a living learning community that focuses on the arts, as well as language languages, as well as a lot of social justice work. The semester in Detroit program originated from um, the residential college. So it put me in this really wonderful, um, I don't want to say cauldron, but in this wonderful world of having all these interdisciplinary areas and the idea of my um, DAS, the Department of Afro-American African Studies and the Residential College are primarily undergraduate programs. And so really working with people um, sort of, I, I'm not training the musicians for tomorrow, although there's some wonderful performers there. I'm training the music lovers, the, the future members of boards, the audiences, when I'm talking about music and also the importance of the humanities and the arts. So my work in music studies, I look at that training as giving me a superpower that a lot of our colleagues outside in the humanities do not have. And that is we understand how sound works. A lot of us are performers, we read music and we can talk about music in very dense analytical ways, as well as ways to say, you know, we don't have to talk about the, um, the nature of what, you know, a descending tetrachord can mean for a lament figure Figure, but we can say there's sort of the, the slope and this repetitive gesture that we hear if you listen to the bass line, that it comes back. And this was a convention connected to sort of sadness or expressing some sort of heaviness. So we can, we, we can go back, we can code switch in how we talk about music. And um, my wonderful colleagues in other disciplines who aren't musicians, but even if they're musicians, they don't have that training to break it down. This is something we are great at. And so having that as sort of a musical background, I love bringing in my colleagues who might not know how to read a score, but to understand what's happening in the symphony and to hear, okay, here, sort of let's have this musical memory, this aural memory of here's a tune and where does it come back and how is it changed? And let's talk about where it is, which instrument, just sort of breaking things down because then I can get a whole new generation of symphony goers who say, we need to hear a whole symphony and we need to have new works. And yes, we can do movie music, that's important, but we also need things called symphonies. Sorry, I've just gone on. So oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm. Your trajectory is so interesting because you were forced into these interdisciplinary conversations as a result of this 
you know, horrific, traumatic, you know, unjust thing that happened in your line of work, you know, at, at a, you know, moved out of a school of music uh, that, and that, gen and it was really generative, you know, intellectually. Um, and for me, um, you know, I didn't have an experience that was, you know, as awful as that, but I, but, but I, but, uh, and I'm lucky for that. Um, but I will say that I, when I was in grad school, um, and this was at Yale and I was in the music theory PhD program there, you know, although I had wonderful mentors, um, you know, including Pat McRaelis, who was my advisor, um, you know, Michael Friedman, who taught uh, post-tonal music theory, Robert Morgan, who taught a variety of classes, um, uh, Jim Habakowski was in musicology, but it was an important teacher for me there as well. Michael Veal was a huge influence, ethnomusicologist, actually he plays an out say in my education um but he was also kind of an outsider to those things as the you know the sole ethnomusicologist there for many years and um as well as being a black faculty member and you know right. there's a lot going on there um but because in part through my conversations with with uh, michael veal uh, and then through my first attempts at labor organizing and getting to be interested in you know the broader university i started being interested in questions um, including questions of race that weren't really answered by the stuff we were reading in the department. And I wanted to get, you know, be able to make connections between close musical analysis and interpretation and these broader questions of like, you know, racial formation and race politics and, you know, how to think about, and in particular about Steve Reich in relation to that, which was ended my, and, and it was one of those subjects that I would hear comments from faculty, you know, again, faculty, I really admire saying questions like, you know, I don't see what race has to do with this. And, and it was, it was almost that the questions were so obvious, you know, in certain ways, well, mm -hmm. Daniel Hamm is black and a victim of police, you know, violence. I mean, and this is, this is like influenced by African music and his ideas about black. I mean, it was like so obvious in some ways that maybe, maybe, you know, the desire for a theorist to kind of, you know, get to the deep structure and get something, you know, that's richer than what you already know, sort of made made that connection seem like not relevant or something. But um, anyway, and so as a result of that, I started talking to faculty members and grad students in other departments, including African American studies. Um, Hazel Carby was a huge help to me. And Paul Gilroy was there. It was the first time uh, someone was willing to talk to me about like Steve Rice's Holocaust po politics. And he was saying, yeah, he said, you have to deal with Holocaust piety. And I was like, wow, like this is someone talking about something that's like in a way that like is meaningful. Um, that is different from what I've been hearing. And then probably the biggest influence outside of music studies was Michael Denning, who's um, um, a wonderful scholar in American studies and a Marxist cultural historian and scholar of music. I mean, a brilliant person who um, ended up becoming on my doctoral committee and just continues to shape what I do today. So those, I don't know, those connections really, they were just, fundamental and so important for me to be able to kind of think about, you know, what I would do as a scholar, you know, what kinds of questions I wanted to answer. Um, you know, I wanted to be thinking about the world and the way that um, these texts I was reading, including like a lot of the publications in the journal New Left Review, which is continues to be a, an important one for me. And, you know, the way that they're trying to understand the world, I want to understand music that way. That was that was sort of my goal, and you know, and and for Steve Reich, the Reich Project, race was central to that. So um, I don't know. I, I anyway, that's that's a sort of a, one version of of my story as to how I got into how I connect what I'm doing to music studies, at least initially. This is so great. I'm I'm so excited that we're touching on all these various topics. Like we're kind of. Uh, jumping between these these various layers of the social structural dynamics of the academy itself and then jumping back into the notation and how i mean it's 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 seamless in a in a sense and i think that's really important to to show that we can jump seamlessly um and that it's not external um, as maybe your experience was Suman. So um, great. And I, I was just wondering if we could 
think a little bit, maybe turn our, our focus to the future and, and think about how engaged music theory and engaged musicology can play a role in changing some of these um, narratives that we have framing our impressions of music studies as they existed until now. So maybe you have some thoughts on that. <laughs> So much of what Sumanth was just saying made me think of what we do, or maybe sort of a tenant of an engaged musical practice and studies in scholarship, is you break it down. You break it down and not assume that we all have the same experiences. And so we allow for different spaces. Sumanth, I'm still reeling from this idea that people don't understand, like, what does race have to do with it? Why would you, you talk about that? And it's like, well, if you have the luxury of positionality where race never features into anything because you are part of the norm, then I guess it doesn't. And if you need to have somebody say, I am black and this is why I'm making this music. Like if that's the, if you need it to be just so direct, um, then you, but, but if I'm getting that connection correctly with um, the Steve Reich, isn't that the come out and show them the, per yeah, oh my gosh. I mean, how more direct can you get where you've got, you know, people are being beaten by the, you know, police and, and civic, protests and, and oh my goodness it's like I am black and I am telling you that the bruised blood needs to come out and we need to show folks that there are many experiences there are many perspectives even when you just have to give up this idea that you certainly know everything but that you are super smart and other super smart people have other experiences and bringing them together can open up questions I mean yes we all talk to the folks who know what we're doing. It's wonderful. And even though I was outside of musicology um, in terms of my home institution, I've been very involved with the Society for American Music and even more and more with the American Musicological Society and with so the Society of Ethnomusicology. It's like I've been, and I've, um, Another thing I've done, which I, I'm hoping sort of answers or addresses this question, is I have found that when I would go to conferences or I would see people doing work that I found really interesting, I would sort of invite them to be part of the Blackness and Opera collection. Or once in the Society for American Music, I was asked to be the chair of a session of three papers that came in individually, and I was added as a chair. And yet they all were looking at opera, sort of these new directions in opera in the 20th century. And they were all junior scholars. One was just finishing a PhD, um, and two others were assistant professors. And I said, these were amazing and great, and they really show new things. Would you be interested? I can do the legwork and let's do a, a cluster for the um, journal JSAM, the Journal for the Society of American Music. This is when colloquies were just becoming a thing in the jams. And so I thought, well, I'm on the editorial board of um, JSAM. Let's see if we can sort of do something. And it was great because I got to know these young scholars and they're really wonderful things they're doing. Um, Kunio Hara was writing about um, Ventula del West and how Italian American immigrants sort of saw that. Danielle Griffith Ward was writing about NBC TV operas and it's like nobody was talking about TV operas in a prolonged way as she was in education programs. And then John Gabriel was looking at this idea of Americanismus in German um, works with, uh, and it was just fascinating. And I'm like, these are so varied. And yet, it, when I started going, you know, to musicology school in the late 80s and early 90s, we were still thinking, okay, what is American opera? How is it? And here were things to say, oh, American opera is infused by German things. It's infused by the Italian American immigrants. So I love sort of bringing people together. I have a, so editing collections and I've been able to do this um, with works in South Africa and I've got a collection now coming out with looking at performance on the um, African continent and so I love this idea of sort of learning and bringing people together but a real element of it is maybe my personality where I, I try 
I try not to be intimidating. Like I had early on, I've heard people say, oh, Naomi is nice, but she's not really smart or how sincere my writing is. And it's like, um, no, this is my like political movement of like trying to be kind and decent and treating you, you know, the way I wanna be treated. I think Will Chang's book with um, Good Vibrations and sort of what does it mean to do good in, in scholarship um, in academia and particularly with music scholarship. It's a way of, of opening things up up and being razor sharp and not being eviscerating mean. It's like, I just don't need that. <laughs> yeah, that's really, wow. <laughs> so much there, it's wonderful. Um, a couple of things that makes me think of, one thing you were saying about the kind of transformation of how to think about, you know, like work in the in the US or in, in American studies, like what you're describing is that parallel that shift from basically, you know, an older formation that was trying to identify, you know, the American character or what is American, you know, in that earlier strain of American studies, scholarship, American musicology, to something that really is more global, that sort of centers the problem of, you know, US empire and thinks critically about it, that tries to kind of like think about, you know, the different, you know, like sort of complex and like fractal like ways in which Americanness can be imagined, like you talked about the Americanismus question, like all those things are, that's just, it's just really inspiring. And also I would say shows like where you're kind of learning from the discipline, not by just extracting stuff from it, but there's these big changes that are occurring as people who really spend a lot of time thinking about the US have been changing their perspective. And so it's great to see that influence what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and one another thing I wanted to kind of react to was the the going back to the positionality question again. You know, you're right that it's, you know, there's the positionality of who's involved in these kinds of particular processes. I'm sort of thinking in part about um, your three part kind of analytic model. But um, but if if scholars are also kind of part of that mix, of course, it makes sense that who we are affects like how we think about what we do. And and certainly for me, you know, in the in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was coming to kind of a much clearer uh, sense of my own self as as a racialized subject. And um, that became, you know, especially intense in the wake of 9-11 and the fact that I would get, you know, yelled at and called terrorist all the time and stuff. And I mean, these were sorts of, but it was a, it was an informative moment, right? Because I grew up in the deep South. And so I faced a lot of uh, racism, especially from white students. And I, and I never really was able to articulate it very well. And so kind of getting into critical scholarship um, as an undergrad and then especially as a grad student helped me to kind of make sense of those experiences. So anyway, um, yeah, a couple of, of of things there, but I I really I don't know what you were saying, Naomi, really resonates with with me in a, a bunch of ways. Oh, I appreciate that because right back at you, I, I'm trying not to. I'm just like yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going to let you answer the next question first, because I, I feel like you, you're just you've got so much gold there that's coming out. Oh, that's very kind of you. I, I, I'm just as happy to have you answer because I love hearing everything you're saying. So anyway. Well, I don't know how you feel about, um, I mean, talking a little bit about what we were just we just kind of rested on there, because I, I also kind of had that experience of I mean, it, it, part of it, yeah, so there is this like two pronged dimension of like being engaged and saying, okay, so it happened around 9-11. So that's why I, I became hyper aware of my identity. But at the same time, it was around the time that I was, you know, starting university, graduate school. And in graduate school, it became, it became much more like obvious how different I was in certain ways. Um, and I wonder if, if we might talk a little bit about that because um, like it, it does go back to what, what um, Sumanth was talking about before in terms of um, feeling like his dissertation topic didn't fit. Uh, it's not, it doesn't feel necessarily like uh, music theory to some of the speakers for, for whom race isn't present um, or that they, they don't, have, they have the luxury of not really 
identifying race is, is impacting their lives for people to take this perspective. But I think it, at the time, race was only for racialized people. And so there was no reason. I mean, even, even if it's relevant to, to you as the scholar of color or whatever, that's not really a dissertation topic because it doesn't appeal to the wider society. Um, but anyway, that's a long, that's a tangent. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to your sort of, if there was an awakening in graduate school around those ideas. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear from Naomi about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Not to put I on can, you, but... I'll talk very personally. I um, was born outside of New York City and then had lived in the city. Um, I grew up in Croton on the Hudson, which is a very wealthy um, Westchester County. We didn't have a lot of money, but it was overall, it, it um, was a, a lovely, beautiful place. I um, had been around a lot of very liberal and open people. And this was, you know, the 70s. Um, so I went to college in, um, well, I'll, I'll mention it. I've had a very privileged um, education. I went to um, West Town, which is in Southeast Pennsylvania, a Quaker boarding school. And that's where I really learned how to study and how to um, sort of learn. It was great. And I was, an, I'm an only child as kind of a nerd. It's before, you know, internet and all of that stuff. And I played the piano and that was sort of what I did. But um, then I went to Barnard in New York and there I, I used to um, uh, relax my hair, straighten my hair, and people didn't know what I was. I could, because there's a real wide diversity in New York and in the city, so I could, some people thought I was Southeast Asian, some people thought I was Spanish and would speak, um, or Latina and speak Spanish to me. <laughs> One person thought I was a Polynesian princess, but I think there were some other things going on there. And some people knew I was black and half Haitian, which, you know, they could see that, which is what I am. And so having that sort Sort of fluidity. I go to graduate school at Harvard and the people were talking about integrated busing as forced busing. I was followed around in stores. I was as though I were going to steal something because I hadn't had that in my previous, you know, upbringing. It was shocking. And so all of a sudden I'm seen as being very black and black people were embracing me. Everybody knew I was black. Whereas in New York, people really didn't know what, what I was and I never was white, but that was um, a real opening. And it was wonderful in some ways because it helped me understand things and see, like go back to situations growing up where people actually, I thought they were much more liberal than indeed they were, but since I was in sort of this, so that's, um, but my questions initially academically, I was, you know, this was the era of the new musicology, Joseph Kerman's um, Contemplating Music book had just come out. One of my um, graduate professors said, oh, that's a nasty little book. <laughs> So I was like, oh, okay, this is where we fit in, in this department and where we're going. And so there were so many ways I didn't fit in. There were, um, I was the only black person in the music department, except for Marie, who was the janitor who was there I saw in the evenings because, you know, we didn't have internet. So you had to be at the library. And um, Eileen Southern had just retired in 87. I got there in 89, and yet there was sort of a, a silence about her. And I'm really grateful for Carol Oja and the project she's organizing around getting Eileen Southern's um, sort of that history of um, her in musicology and particularly at Harvard. So um, I, that's how did blackness become an issue for me? Well, I didn't grow up not thinking I was black. No, I definitely did. But there was, I was in a lot of predominantly white environments. And so um, while in some way that made me good for, you know, fitting into the mold of the school I was given, I was very much on the outside of how people were really accepting me. Um, and I really had to prove myself to be an opera scholar. And I, um, I wasn't allowed to be a Verdi scholar. I just, I couldn't find the mentoring. I would write articles, they'd be rejected for things that weren't really about what I was doing. Nobody would, 
sort of take me on. So it's interesting that Harold Powers was a name that came up, Bill Gossett. I met with all of these people. I had beautiful introductions given my pedigree at Harvard and Lewis Lockwood is saying, hey, meet the student, talk. And nobody, I think that's why I want to reach out to younger scholars or more junior in the process because none of that happened for me. The wonderful mentoring I had was from people outside and other disciplines who were just kind to me and had a, a sort of a, a sense of, I bet you're going through something. I mean, this is an interesting topic um, is how much are people of color allowed to not talk about issues of color or gender or sexuality or something else? How much are we allowed to be abstract? How much are we allowed to sort of fit in and have that be an, um, an accepted thing? Woof, sorry, I've gone all over the place with this question. <laughs> well, that's great and amazing. Yeah, it's, it's I, it, just reacting to the last point you said, I think in, in music theory, I've often seen until recently, and I do think, you know, Phil Ewell's work and others have really kind of opened things up a lot. I mean, there were certainly people writing about race before and thinking critically about it, but um, but I think his work has changed the conversation significantly. I, I, I would say my impression in music theory, because it has long, I, again, I think, speaking of theory in the past, maybe 20 years ago, uh, more than now, but um, had such a strong sense of what it was, what it was supposed to be and what you were supposed to do in the field. Um, I felt that, you know, it was more typical that scholars of color would do, you know, some music the traditionally music theoretical thing and in fact the, the being more traditional was sort of the the sort of countervailing strategy but i think you're right i think as things have changed you know like the pressure to kind of conform to one's identity in some way uh, is probably a new one that i haven't seen as much in music theory and i you know i hope i'm not guilty of you know fomenting that big in my zeal to try to encourage people to think critically about what it is we do but um, just what you're I, yeah, saying about who is allowed to be in music theory. How, did you see many people of color? I mean, I think part of it was that it was a system that was a little um, hostile in environment. I mean, one of my dear friends, Eli Hisama, is like a real pioneering voice as being a generation, you know, a woman theorist and a Japanese American theorist. Phil Ewell is, is terrific, but he's he's been in the field a while and finally we're something is opening up and his voice is coming through and I don't think that's just because he was laissez-faire I think there are certain structures and boundaries that are there your position in music theory is huge for somebody to see oh my goodness he is a music theorist and he finished his PhD and he went to Yale and he's tenured wow, this is huge. I wish I had seen you like you like time travel. I wish you had been one of my mentors or one of the people I could look to. So I think I, I really am hoping that we are at this new place. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, not at all. That, and I likewise, I wish that I had been able to work with you. I mean, that would have been one of those things that would have been really inspiring to me. I would say that my personal experience, um, it it was definitely a, a pretty small number of faculty of color in theory who did like sort of played a major mentorship role for me, but but Ellie was one of them. She um, she really like paid attention early on. I got a uh, one of the diversity travel grants. I would say Ellie and um, and Yayoi Uno Everett were two people who really kind of helped you know, they paid attention to and liked what I was doing and thought, and I was talking about race and Steve Reich and other stuff. The, um, I, I was interested in Marxism or the politics of the academy. And these were, they were very supportive of those things. And they represented something that I think um, I've been long inspired by, but couldn't name until Fred Moss named it for me, which was the, the fringe culture of the SMT. He said, the fringe culture of the SMT, the Society for Music Theory, is this amazing space where all this really unusual creative stuff has gone on for, you know, for some decades. But 
it's never been at the center of the field. And so he, he said, for me, he said, I really identify with that fringe culture. I mean, Fred is kind of one of the key figures in helping to make it, I think, yeah. um, in part by doing queer studies, thinking about narrativity. I mean, all the stuff that he's done, right? And so when he said that, I was, I realized that is where I feel at home as a music theorist and why I do think of myself as one, because I have been very much shaped by that, that fringe culture. And a lot of the scholars of color, the few scholars of color who are in the field, they have also for many years been in that fringe as well. And so, um, so yeah, just to, to echo what you're saying that um, there, and to respond to what you're saying, there, there definitely were those, um, theorists of color who were, you know, who absolutely made it possible for me to do what I'm doing, certainly for Phil as well. Um, and Phil himself was, uh, you know, an influence on me because he was the chair of this at the time they called SMT diversity committee. And this was, you know, over a decade ago now. And uh, as part of that process, he, you know, we, uh, he helped to solicit essays and talks for um, for the diversity committee's panel. And that led to one of the essays that I wrote about on, you know, music theory, diversity in the neoliberal academy, which is on the, the engaged, uh, music studies or engaged music theory, uh, website. Um, and it's really, so I think, you know, there's absolutely no way I could have done what I've done without having these people, you know, having been, you know, sort of been in more vulnerable positions, uh, you know, you know, trying to do music theory as they saw it um, before me. So yeah, I, it's a, a really great point. But I will say too, equally important were people outside music theory. I mean, I can't stress enough the importance of Michael Veal. I mean, just someone who had these conversations with me, you know, almost daily about, you know, what is this experimental music? What does race have to do with it? How do we think about it? How does it sound? His hermeneutic instincts are just so spot on. I mean, even in my most recent, uh, uh, book rethinking Reich, um, his reinterpretation of the maracas not only as an Afro diasporic instrument, but also as a oh wow thank you, uh, but also as a, um, a Native American rattle and saying that the kind of psychedelic things that you're hearing in this really link to this. And then Carrie O'Brien was at that talk and she said yeah and I, there's evidence of you know because she's a, also a minimalism scholar published in that book um, of Reich you know having been to um, out in the in the in the southwest and west going to um um you know various uh you know indigenous music rituals etc and so was following that kind of reference through and that made it into the the argument which i think was really inspiring so so it's it's been definitely a mix of those at least for scholars of color who are inspirations some inside music theory and definitely a number outside i so appreciate sumanth your outlining different generations and sort of saying names and letting people know, wait a minute, they, the, here are the waves, this is how it happened. Um, feminist scholarship talks a lot about first wave feminism with the um, Seneca Falls Conference in the mid 19th century and then second wave happening, um, you know, as late as sort of as the women's movement was happening in the United States around the 50, uh, 60s and 70s. And then the millennium with the third wave is sort of more of a global thing. I like this, this idea of thinking in waves sort of different people. When Ellie and I were in graduate school and we were both were first years at the same time, it was so wonderful to see her, to have her there, even though I was a musicology and she was in theory it was a small enough group and then when she decided that she could um do more productive things <laughs> and not be yeah um beaten down as much in the um harvard music department at that time it was we stayed in touch and so i i see and she has I, she's the person I can go to and say, hey, what's going on? You know, this happened to me. Having these conversations, I think it's wonderful now that there are these interracial sort of um, non-Black people um, and non-people of color talking with um, Black and scholars who are, you know, people of color and sort of having these true conversations. But one thing that's important to know is that we've been having these conversations in our own groups. This is what strengthened us, whether it's our roommates, whether it's a distant relative, whether it's somebody in a, a group, but walking around with 
and being perceived in a certain way, it's just nice to see other like visible role models. There are so many invisible role models, you know, people who come out and help us see things, but it's just to name, I, I just want to say um, a real tribute to Vivian and Danielle and all the people behind the scenes with this um, Engage Music Theory, having a space where people can name names and sort of give a tribute and say, give a shout out to the folks who were so important to helping us stay around. Yeah, that's a great point. I, in relation to that, I want to say for me, even though they're not academics, my, my parents played a major role in this. I had these intense conversations about my work, about Steve Reich and blackface minstrelsy, you know, a kind of point of connection um, between, you know, what I've, some of what I've done and, and your amazing work, Naomi, but um, that, um, uh, and I remember my dad, who has such a fascinating background himself, he was in the Br British Merchant Navy for eight years, uh, not typical for someone of his, you know, elite, uh, upper caste background in India, but because he wasn't as academically successful, he ended up going to trade school and then going into the British Merchant Navy. And so, and he, and I, I told him about like my work on Reich and how I was upset with, you know, I was dealing with these issues and talking about minstrelsy and, um, and he was saying, you know, he said, I understand, you know, like I, when I was on ships, there was this television show that was I think it was British, it's called the black and white minstrels. And he said, and my shipmates would say, don't you think this is funny? And I would say, no, it's not funny. <laughs> and, you know, and, and he was saying that they just didn't get this. And he said, so I understand what you're saying. I understand why you're frustrated with, with this guy. He said, but if you're really going to write about him, you have to learn to be sympathetic to him, like to understand who he is and get, get a, you know, try to understand it in his shoes too. And, and, um, and it was a really like great moment that uh, honestly, it was probably one of the most important moments in my whole dissertation process for having him say that made me think, oh, this isn't only writing against Reich, you know, it's trying to kind of think complexly about who he is. And of course, in relation to who I am and trying to kind of develop this picture of what's happening. Um, so yeah, so I mean, at least for me, you know, my, my parents played that uh, a role in that too. Oh my gosh, what wisdom you got. I think one of the big topics of today, and we do not have to go there now, but how do we, I think holding people accountable for things that went under the radar regarding sexual harassment or racial um, ignorance that was painful and damaging, it's important to bring people out about that. However, the way cancel culture is developing is so complicated because we are complicated people and having a sense, I mean, my own personal view is just having a little more mercy and forgiveness to move on to sort of new things. Again, it's not not holding people accountable or being an apologist, but for your dad to say, well, what is it like from his vantage point? That just makes your stuff stronger. And it allows you not to just be, you know, I'm mad and I'm angry, which is totally justified. We need to have that out there. I, I do believe that. But okay, where does it bring us next? Or how can we incorporate that into sort of moving forward, not just ignoring it, but sort of, okay, we have to sort of deal with that legacy. That, that it's taken me a long time to realize. <laughs> So uh, how wonderful that your your father um, and um, that your mother was also sort of involved with some of these conversations too. How wonderful. And look what they did. They like produced you and all the <laughs> academic success you've had. Well, I'm, I'm just really fortunate. I, I, I have amazing parents and I'm really lucky too. I mean, they're wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm really excited. I haven't seen them in you know, a year and a half, and I'm going to be traveling uh, on a road trip to go see them in Louisiana. So I'm, I can't wait to do that. It's uh, been a long time coming. Um, but yeah, you're, I, I do feel really lucky. And yes, my mom was also very much a part of those conversations. Um, I, I have to say too, um, I mean, I agree with you on the sort of the point about mercy and forgiveness. I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I always temper these things by recognizing my own positionality in this. I think, South Asian Americans, especially of upper caste backgrounds, are incredibly privileged people in the US. I mean, that, you know, that doesn't mean my parents weren't economically wealthy and they, their whole trajectory was 
uh, complicated in part by my dad's background in this kind of trade school thing and then getting laid off a lot in the in in the Chicago and um, uh, Michigan area before he moved to the south but um, but in terms of their intellectual inheritances and their expectations that their children would just go to college and get advanced degrees and they were doing that themselves I mean there was just a kind of thing that's a, a you know a privilege of background and so I'm so I'm always kind of like you know, trying to kind of figure out how my positionality relates to what I'm about to say, but, but, and I think it does. And I, and I just want to acknowledge that, but at the same time, I also recognize that, you know, it's, it's really important to have a complex picture of the thing that you're engaging with. And when Will Robin interviewed me recently for his sound expertise podcast on a, an alleged racist statement that Steve Reich had made in the seventies that was reported by Val Wilmer, the photographer, and a writer. Um, this was something that um, uh, seemed, you know, important to kind of think through again in a kind of complicated way. Like, yes, there's a race. If Rice said this, which is, I think, very possible, um, he just says he didn't remember it. Um, but, um, but it's, but it's like, what's what's behind this? And I think that that's like unpacking the the racist statement, trying to figure out what's at stake in it. To me, that's. That's important not to just let it stand as a kind of oh this is racist and now this is bad of course it's bad like we of course we need to call it out as racist but let's like get deeper with the thing so that we can get to you know try to build a picture of like where is this coming from and uh one of the lessons of rice's statement was that at least as i read it at the time is that it was a product of the conversations around you know musical ownership and race and being able to have conversations across racial lines because this was in the moment of the kind of intensities of the the black power black liberation movement and so you know as a white jewish person who you know was relatively wealthy not like but also living the kind of you know poor downtown new york life and being able to kind of have conversations across interracial lines in ways that for him we're in part about conversations to learn and to think as uh, you know across them for in part extractive purposes but they were but they were also you know i think there was a sense of hurt there that that's the i won't repeat the comment but that's where the comment came from and so there's it's just trying to kind of un understand and like there's there's privilege there's racism there's like hurt there's all this stuff kind of going on in the in, in a comment like that if it's real which i think it probably is um that seems important to kind of get at a nuanced picture of what's going on before you then figure out what the right action is. And that's basically what I, I didn't, definitely didn't want to discount people's anger. I mean, heck, I had a lot of it myself, but um, but trying to kind of, you know, encourage, you know, you, you sort of mentioned a couple of times doing a deep dive, you know, which I really like that. And I, I, I think in general, I want to encourage people to do a deep dive with thinking about, you know, race or gender or sexuality or class or, capitalism or whatever it is so that we I don't know so that then when we take actions we we take actions that are are uh are better informed absolutely I I haven't fully thought out this next part so heavens it might get cut but what you're saying with this understanding and deeper sort of contextualizing I'm it's not about pretending it didn't happen, but by acknowledging it and acknowledging the pain that it caused, and also by, you know, he's still alive, and so there's a, a possibility of changing things. I think this hooks towards something, uh, it's connecting to something I've been thinking a lot about reparations. And there's, that's a, I know it's a loaded word and it means a bunch of things, but part of the reparative movement to acknowledge it and to deal with it, but you can't undo it. Hopefully there can be a change and maybe we can go forward. I mean, we're doing, yeah, I, I'm still thinking about it, but we have so many cases of, you know, Wagner and how do we teach this music in our classes, especially when we have, you know, Jewish students and students who have been taught to fear him. Or what do we do with James Levine recordings as an opera scholar that's really complicated. So I like this idea of being able to extract the good where you can to acknowledge the bad and figure out sort of what is a, a process moving forward that feels reparative. 
Yeah, this is a great question. And I'm, I really embrace the conversations around thinking about reparations because they're so, they're so important. I mean, you know, they, it's funny how for a long time, I mean, the right still freaks out about it, especially the white supremacist, you know, uh, you know, right. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it's something now that now that the conversation is open, Tanasi Coates did a great job to kind of, I think, rethink that. Um, oh, Hannah Jones yeah. has a beautiful yes. essay last summer. Yep. Oh, great, great. I have to time. look at that one. Um, and this is, I guess, one thing I'd be interested to hear from you, Naomi, is what do you think, you know, racial reparations in music and music institutions, what could or should they look like? I, I feel like this is something that you've probably thought a lot about and or I'm starting to think about. To think and, about and then <laughs> and I don't know, I'd be I'd be really curious for me. The, the canon is a real problem. I mean, as someone who loves the canon, right? I mean, I love yeah. I know me too. Schubert and Mozart and Beethoven and Verdi and Beethoven. whatever, right? Like, yeah. But <laughs> I also feel that too much music programming is about going back to the same old things, you know? And if uh, it, yeah. it should just be, you know, I really like one of the things you do is you also, you talk about new operas. That's really important, you know, like to kind of bring, if you're going to bring attention to opera and not only it's, you know, sort of history of racism stereotype, which just seems so endemic to the whole thing. Um, how do you, you can get beyond it in part by thinking about new opera and newer opera. And that's- yeah. Oh, I like yeah. that, thank you. I'm not even conscious, you know, I'm just like, oh, I wanna know what's going on now and what's happening. But I think some of this, you know, this idea of reparations, the article, and I can definitely send it to you guys, but it was the New York Times Magazine about a year after the 1619 Project. And I think part of the title is Reparations Now. And she just outlines things beautifully. I, I'm a, despite what the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill regents are doing or the chancellors or whoever, you know, I'm a huge fan. Um, but I'm still working on this. So an engaged musicology sort of opens things up. So we begin to ask questions about who am I in this process? Who are the people performing it? Who are the people composing it? How is it relating to the audience? I then move to this idea of sort of an activist stance in musicology or music studies. And what does it mean to say, wait a minute, there are certain wrongs that need to be addressed. And now with this idea of reparations, I'm sort of, I don't know where to go, but one big part of it is we have to acknowledge the pain that's happened with the bad things. We can't just say, oh, that's the past. Okay, fine. We're, we're done now. It's like when you have, I mean, just think of it when you have a bad experience in your department or somebody, a colleague or something has happened, you can't just move past it. You have to move through it. And ideally you can move through it in that both or all the parties are feeling like, oh, this we're doing something out of a negative. There's some sort of positive, or at least we're minimizing the effect of the negative. I, again, I'm still messing with this, but I really think this reparative, maybe instead, of, it comes from reparations, but how do we try to acknowledge what's happened and to really, you know, just to say, I'm sorry. And if it's something, you know, this discipline was founded on, oh gosh, I've been reading things, you know, with um, Guido Adler is doing all, you know, all this sort of coming out of the eugenicist and sort of the supremacy of sort of a German music. I had nothing to do with that, but that's part of my, my discipline's history. And I, you know, I'm so sorry about that. I'm so happy for the great music. You, you know, it's like, how do we, how do we really think through this? So we don't feel plagued and haunted and continually traumatized by it. Yeah, this is a great point. I, for me, one of the great, and for me, I'm coming to this late, I should say, I mean, you know, but I will say that the great uh, consequences of the last, you know, year and a half have been for me, just pushing me to listen to and teach more black composers, more uh, women composers, women identifying composers, and just really help like reimagine my own pedagogy and, you know, in ways that allow me to, you know, in some cases, teach similar kinds of things or techniques in other cases like help me kind of think differently about what is i'm supposed to be teaching and you know and that so i'm i'm really excited about that but it, it it's interesting to me that it also isn't limited to um 
to those things, but also just trying to kind of undo what it is that, you know, the canon might be telling me is valuable and isn't valuable. I've been listening to a lot of uh, Czech composers recently. I've gotten into Novak and Suk, who I think are wonderful composers. And really, you know, and I've been having conversations with Michael Beckerman and other people about the people who know much more about this than I do, and trying to kind of just realize, wow, there's, you know, these composers were doing things like, you know, Novak and Suk were doing stuff like at the same time as, you know, as Debussy and Schoenberg and stuff. And they, they are very much in the mix of what yeah. modernism is, right? Yeah. And so it's just the more we blow it up and get a richer picture instead of the, the singular figures, you know, the evental figures or whatever, if you want to do it in the Baduian way. Like, I, I think that's really, I don't know, for me, it's just a, it gives you a, a more accurate picture of what was happening. You know, and then understanding like Dvorak's, uh, you know, sort of role and then his connection to the US and the fact that, you know, like Doug Shadle's new book, which emphasizes the way that the New World Symphony and his music was getting attacked because it was black or seen as black. I mean, that's fascinating, right? And, you know, things that Americanists. Um, oh, whoops. I think I froze. No, nope, uh, you're there. I'm there. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> and the fact that, um, these kinds of things are important for me to learn about or, or getting in my own teaching. It's really helping me kind of, I don't know, understand the practice that I'm interested in better. So, you know, it's, you know, for, there's an empirical aspect to this, you know, like getting a, a richer, fuller picture of the thing that we think we knew. We don't really yes. know. I am so there. And I also, to sort of connect this to this idea of a reparative feeling, I want to be grateful to the forefathers, because they usually were, who were writing this history, because they were trying to add whatever they could. And now we get to add more. So we get sort of a more in detail tapestry of how this sort of history of sound has developed. It's not to say, oh, the bad, you know, the people in the past were bad, they were leaving everyone out. That's that's possible, but the, you also could say, well, maybe they were just doing what they could do. <laughs> maybe they just they only had the bandwidth for you know five composers in that you know the beginning the the fin de siècle sort of turn of the century for you know, but now it's like oh we can add more so let's do it. Their work we're just building on it. Um, but we shouldn't say, oh, no, it stops with what they did back there. I mean, good grief. I don't think people are going to stop with us. I hope not. That would be boring. <laughs> I hope they pay sort of they can recognize us when the waves that we're in as, you know, music history and theory and ethnomusicology and scholarship is developing and, you know, sort of ride these waves to get to more inclusive pictures for what that reality is as as they're realizing it you know as we move forward in the in the to the future yeah i totally agree i mean think of a figure like william austin you know who was trying to rethink how he taught uh, pedagogy so that it wasn't taught in a music history in a linear way. He was addressing and thinking critically about blackface minstrelsy, its connection to, and reappropriation and transformation by Ray Charles. I mean, this is like all sorts of stuff that like, you know, in his Stephen Foster uh, book and stuff. And so, oh, oh good, good. Oh, yeah. Thank you for yeah. giving us that reference. Can yeah. you see uh, William Austin. Yeah, he is. Okay. I, I encountered him because he was one of Steve Reich's teachers. So at Cornell. So, um, yeah. so, but that's what these interesting kinds of uh, mm -hmm. routes help us understand. You're absolutely right. People in the past were, and he was a gay man, and that was a part of, I think, his background in history. And so there's there's a lot kind of going on in, in, in the past. I think you're really right, Naomi, to kind of not simplify um, what was happening in past scholarship. And um, yeah, so I, I know I completely agree with that. And I agree with the, the excitingness for the future. I mean, there's so much to do. Just, um, you know, I remember teaching, uh, the last of, I think I made it as a, a, a test assignment, uh, the last of Ruth Crawford Seeger's preludes prior to the, you know, the connection she made with, uh, with, um, uh, with Charles Seeger and thinking, man, this piece is like a magical piece of music. It's cosmic and uni universe-like and galactic and scope and quality and makes me think of Messian. And I mean, so much of her music makes me think of music that came after her, but, um, but it's, you know, it's like, 
just having a magical experience of that. And then I was sending it to a friend who's not even, uh, he came to Ellie Hassama gave a talk on, on Ruth Crawford recently. And so this friend came to that talk and then I sent him this piece. He was like, wow, that was so great. And so, you know, it, it, and this is a scholar of Chinese literature and former bandmate, a great friend, a wonderful musician, but you know, not someone in music studies. And I, and so seeing those kinds of possibilities as part of, reimagining what it is that we do and again to me i'm coming to it late i mean ellie was there right like from the beginning but um but i'm glad i'm i'm kept right. trying to catch up now oh as long as we're, we're we're we keep moving we're trying i know this is sort of an odd thing and i don't mean to hijack this conversation but it's so terrific talking about these things and i see vivian and danielle are sort of listening and engaged do you guys want to jump into the conversation and i don't mean to scare you but yeah let's have your voices because i know your feelings a lot of you know you, you, i can just tell you're you're reacting to these things you were technically unmuted first, Danielle, so I can go first if you want. Well, no, I just, I got really excited. I, I'm, I'm one of those people that I, I find it very difficult to, to sit quietly. Like if I'm engaged, I'm, I'm really good, <laughs> fired <good. up. laughs> No, I, I wanted to tie some of those threads together because there's so many, like, I, I think just like echoes coming through this conversation. Like when, when you were talking, Naomi, earlier about exposing, sort of becoming vulnerable and, and sort of engaged musicology being in, in a, a way of embracing our vulnerabilities. And then talking about that Reich comment and um, how very easily things can can become essentialized like the 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 the, the topic of of one sentence could cancel reich as as if um and the, the issue there is that um there is no there is no forgiveness or acknowledgement of vulnerabilities there and i think we're all guilty of being racist at one point or another or say, making a racist comment and we're all guilty of making a, a misogynist comment or upholding misogynist patriarchal standards in some way or another and if we can't say i i did this i'm sorry if there's either a fear that there's going to be retribution or that that people just completely aren't aware that you can also be a whole complete person and sometimes say something that doesn't is isn't okay um then there won't be reparations and it, and it's like what 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 you you both have been talking about we can't stop and then start a new uh, uh, that's not going to happen first of all people don't want to and second it's just not possible and so the only way to do this is to is to go back and revisit and and you know, we expose these these threads. Yeah, that we're feeling that need to be addressed. But I, I so appreciate your saying um, we, we, we all have a little of this, like we say these things. One, we're human, but two, we're part of a dominant system where we have, these have been embedded in us and they come out in weird ways and that's when we can recognize it. Vivian, did you want to jump in or Danielle, I don't mean to stop you if you're not done. Oh, I'm just feeling a lot of gratitude and feeling heartened by the stories that you both shared as um, someone who's, you know, experienced a lot of culture shock entering academia and grad school. Um, so um, I actually did have sort of a question that I was thinking about waves and generations in the future. Um, if you had any thoughts or advice that you would want to share for up and coming music scholars on how to navigate, find community, uh, find support within music studies if they decide to stay? Wow, that's a great question. Um, it sounds like in part you're already doing that with the engaged uh, music theory and like connecting to scholars of other scholars of color. Um, I, I know that that was, that was important for me, um, but I, I will say that um, you know, it's a, I don't know, a academia is really brutal and it, it, there, it's a very unjust system in many ways. And I guess the only other, I guess the things that I would sort of recommend based on what I did um, were one, yeah, try to find allies wherever you can find them. I mean, whether they're in the, both in the field and outside it. Um, I know for me, political organizing was so central to making me feel like I had some sort of capacity to improve this messed up thing that I really cared about, which is academia. Um, so that 
that was really important. Um, I also felt like it was really crucial to have spaces outside of academia. And I know for me, like having the the band I've been in for now, um, gosh, I mean, 15 years. It's uh, and then before I had a, I was in a country band in grad school. Like that stuff was for a long time, totally disconnected from my research. It only started kind of getting connected to it when I was working on the song Kentucky with uh, ethnomusicologist Anna Schultz. But um, for a long time, I was just kind of, it was another space. And I think having a creative and productive space, I, I, I can't recommend that enough. Um, yeah, um, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I forgot, maybe I'll come back. But um, I don't know what, I'm curious to know what you found. Um, in terms of what's been helpful for you thus far, because I, I know for me it was it was a struggle at times. Oh, uh, for me or all of us? Yeah, anyone. I was including Vivian, but uh, yeah, all of you. I mean, Ellie's name has come up many times in our conversation already, but her work was very inspiring for someone who, you know, as of an adjacent identity and background. I think the power in seeing other people and we make these sort of connections because we're yearning for them. It's really wonderful. Uh, for me, one thing I'm finding now is it's hard to benefit from a system that you're so critical of. And while I'd always see myself on the periphery and the outside, I don't want to say that that was easy, but it wasn't. But I was very fortunate to be in an, a tenure track job and to achieve tenure as you know, complicated as that was. Right now, I think I don't want to talk about sort of survivor guilt or something because I feel I'm only right now in a position of like, oh my gosh, I can pay my bills. And, you know, people, <laughs> I'm hoping when I go to conferences, people aren't going to hand me their dirty dishes anymore. <laughs> you know, for being confused as the help. Yes, that has happened even recently. So, but it's more damning when you know that there's nobody who, or it feels like nobody knows you now, you know, hopefully some folks uh, won't do that. But what really helps for me at this position is to reach, to keep reaching out and to say, uh, like, let me, let me hear what you're going through to not just focus on myself. Um, <sighs> because that's, you know, I know that story, you know, like, I, so one thing that's really, like, when I was going through everything uh, Sumanth was talking about, finding other folks and having a contrast to your academic life, since I'm now, I feel I have a little more power to try to bring up topics and try to say, let's be kind here or speak up a little bit more. And for me, that there's a real, um, it's, it's, I'm getting better at that vulnerability, but I like what it brings. I like sort of breaking down the, the, the fear in people's face and having it soften and like, okay, now let's talk about these real, and I do believe this, it's gonna sound naive, but these real goodies that we get to think about. I love keeping that relationship with the music for me has been really important, especially as I start looking more and more at race and gender and um, socioeconomic in, uh, inequities. It's just so helpful to have sort of the sonic gorgeousness and then to want to share that with everyone everybody with ipads and iphones they're listening to music but i want them to hear the joy in opera that you know that'll be different from the joy i hear but to, to be able to go there or in a beethoven string quartet or in a janacek um piece you know like i want people to have that because i think ugh, trying not to sound so 18th century moralistic, but I think it makes us kinder people. It enriches us and makes us better citizens on the planet. <laughs> yeah, I think some of the greatest conversations I had when I was sort of writing my dissertation and working through really hard topics was two o'clock in the morning with my friends who worked with me at a pizza shop and they were all at my house and I would whip out my computer and I'd say, look at this diagram I made and they're not musicians, they don't read music. It's nothing, it's not related at all to what they do but they're just like blown away because they're like, this is a thing people do. Like you can, you can do that. And I said, yeah, you could do that. And then they, you know, when they start asking questions then I recognize, oh, okay. So there's, these are the parameters that I need to address as well because it's not just about me and what I think about the music. <laughs> 
Love that. Oh God, I had, I, it makes me think of the conversations I used to have with my dear friend, Matt Katz, who then later became the country band in New Haven's uh, bassist for a while. Um, but I would just hang out at his cop, at his copy shop and he would kind of hold court. I mean, he was this kind of master of finding tons of bootlegs of, you know, Bob Dylan, Grateful <laughs> Dead, whatever. Like you know, we would just sit and chat about whatever. And it was, it was a wonderful space to kind of like, here's a smart, learned, you know, interesting person who I like, like, you know, shooting the bull with and he's, you know, and he's not an academic, right? But he's smart. There are lots of people out there who are really smart. And um, I never, I never fail to kind of try to remind myself of that, that, that academia is not the sole place for intelligence. Like, in fact, in some ways, I think sometimes academia can shelter us from the intelligence that other people get more readily because they don't, they don't live in that or, you know, work primarily in that space. But um, yeah, anyway, uh, just thinking of thinking of your your pizza shop and your friends. It's cool. <laughs> you know, as we live with these different identities that are subjected to oppressive power structures, it really is an element of activism to enjoy life, <laughs> to say, I'm not going to be overwhelmed by it, but I'm going to find some joy that isn't that that you can't take all the joy from me, even though I'm at the bottom of the system, that I still have that agency. So I, I like to, you know, I want everybody to have lots of power. I'm not trying to say, oh, just accept your position, but to have, you do your best work when you're alive and we got to stay alive. I think that's yeah. like the perfect sentence. Like we, <laughs> we can make it better than that. Yeah, I think I, I defer to that. <laughs> <laughs> amazing fascinating i could listen to you talk all day <laughs> well we're in a conversation <laughs> well um it's been a joy to welcome both of you professor naomi andre and professor Simon gopinath today in our conversation with myself and with danielle and uh, we just want to invite our viewers to keep on the lookout for our forthcoming blog posts in the next months. And in the meantime, you can visit our website for more information at engagedmusictheory.com. And again, thank you so much for the conversation.